The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. If you just take those first five steps, wow. you're not gonna be able to stop stepping because it's just so beautiful. The variety of grasses, it's beautiful. It's, it's in really good shape. You know, a real good example of the Chihuahuan Desert grassland out here. I like to refer to it as the original classroom. The human mind is wired to be attentive to this. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. I'm Adrienne Sabom, and I'm a mother of two children. I grew up down here on a South Texas ranch had wide open spaces to pretty much do whatever we wanted to outside. Usually during quail season, every weekend we would be quail hunting. Quail hunting and nature go kind of hand in hand. You are outside all day long. You see quail, you see dove, you see deer. Just spending quality time with your family, your friends enjoying just being in the wilderness. I'm Sochi Rodriguez. I'm a mother and I'm from El Paso. I was born and raised here. We share a border with Ciudad Juarez. The crossroads of cultures, the crossroads of peoples, and the vastness of the desert. It's a really special place where lots of things come together. and Sometimes they collide. Sometimes they mesh. <laughs> we live right in the center of the city. Calissa and I are a bit of a team. We all three love adventures. <laughs> I don't have to convince Calissa to go on a hike. <laughs> I don't have to convince her to dig in the dirt. I grew up romping here. These are good sticks. Where'd you find them? Right over there. It's never hard for kids to connect to nature. I believe that we have built things that have gotten in the way, and they are not given the opportunities that they need to connect. You have to see this. This mountain just booms right up from this vast, flat landscape. <laughs> it's visually beautiful, but it's also um, such an incredible space to crack open and explore. We are lucky to have the largest urban state park in North America here in El Paso. Tens of thousands of acres of wild space preserved by the state of Texas. We're fortunate to have a state park in our backyard and we're fortunate to have a mountain as the artery of our community. Adrian and I met at a Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation event. I met Sochi at the We Will Not Be Tamed campaign launch party. And we were talking about, well, she has never shot a gun. She couldn't fathom that. And I had never hiked the Franklin Mountains. And so it kind of evolved into, well, maybe we should each do each other's thing. We got to the ranch and it's just more than I ever dreamed it could be. It's incredibly green, which is refreshing. I don't live in a green place. There she is. We arrived. Awesome. Hugged Adrian. Are you so tired? And we got to go straight over to the horse stalls. And then got ready to ride horses. 
That will be my transport. <laughs> and Sochi, of course, from the get-go, was excited about doing something new. Today, Calissa rode a horse for the first time ever. Here you go. With Henrietta, cowgirl. She was scared at first, but once she got on the horse, she grew much more comfortable. I can't believe how emotional I was seeing her be on that horse. Good, baby. You're doing amazing, Calista. In my life at this moment, most of my mountaintops involve Calista doing new things and doing big girl things and overcoming fears. After horseback riding, we went to the big event. The moment we've all been waiting for. Sochi's shooting a gun for the first time. Your finger's never on the trigger until you're ready to fire. So it's gonna go right there. Safety's on and then you kind of get in position. It's the craziest thing I've ever done. I was really, really scared. I'm a hot mess with this thing. Okay. Well, I feel like it's gonna go I off. Know, I do too. And it could be this pad if you want to take the, the vest off. She was super nervous in the beginning. You could tell her hands were shaking. She was sweating. In here? Holy. I learned a lot. Safety's on. So don't put your finger on the trigger until you're ready. Oh! I shook after every clay, <laughs> but then I finally got into the groove and Pull. I felt a little bit better. Pull. Pull. Again. Ah, almost. There you go. Dang. Okay. Oh. Once she did it a couple of times, she really relaxed. Did I hit that one? Uh huh. And I hit one. By the end, she was having a Pull. great time. Oh, <laughs> Good job! I learned to shoot alongside Adrian and her family. Okay, pull. I could not have been with more amazing people. Ooh, wow. <laughs> I was not raised around guns or hunting um, to see that there's a whole other way of life laced with respect for guns and respect for hunting. I really have learned uh, a different perspective on things that I had never had contact with. My friend Adrian is in El Paso, Texas. I'm out here visiting Sochi and Calista. We're gonna hang out with Calista and just do our thing. Yeah. You cannot come to El Paso without taking a look at our border, border wall. and gazing over into Mexico and uh, letting that sort of rock your soul a little bit. <laughs> and of course, we're gonna eat some really good food. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna go try on some insane West Texas boots. I like it. Oh, yeah. That is gorgeous. Here's our mountain. I also firmly believe that you cannot come to El Paso without hiking the Franklin Mountains. We're going to summit. We're not just going to do a little hike. I think we're going to do a big one. Intimidating. I have been hiking before, but I've never hiked in this environment, the arid, rocky terrain. Concerned about the hydration. How much water do you take? We'll usually take three liters plus a bottle of water. Yeah, now that it's summertime, I'll probably carry six liters of water with us tomorrow. Golly. I think we're ready. Let's do it. It's just before seven. I'm and excited. We're gonna take Adrian to the top of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> There she goes. <laughs> if you just take those first five steps, you're not gonna be able to stop stepping because it's just so beautiful. Anybody can do it. You can go for a short amount of time. You can go on a flat surface. You can find whatever works for you. See him? Little tiny little guy. See it, black and brown? Oh yeah. Look at that tail. That's the great thing about hiking it. You see so much more than you do from a distance. There's a couple of pretty steep inclines, but they're beautiful because you're surrounded in yucca and ocotillo and the ground is red. And I think it's a great way to just sort of crack right into the mountain. You 
get a sense of how giant the world is and how little you are and you can't help but be quiet and just stop and be humbled in that space. To just sort of be silent and parallel in a place that's much bigger than you are. It's a beautiful and a, and a really powerful thing to experience. I love the sound so much. Isn't that amazing? Like glass. And that's my tear. So we're, we're about halfway. Vamos. Here we go. Climbing. Hiking the Franklins is basically lunges, <laughs> all the way up the mountain. Thousands of lunges under some pretty intense sun would be scary to most. Um, Adrian is approaching this with a really fantastic enthusiasm. <laughs> the ridge line is in sight. What? Almost there. It's breathtaking. Doing this with Sochi, it's a bond that you can create. The anticipation is killing me. <laughs> and doing something that you both enjoy and being outdoors, you can really have quality time where there's no distractions. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. We did it. You see forever. <laughs> you just have to expose your children, and then they have a love of being in the outdoors. But the key is Amazing. exposure. How do you feel? <laughs> do you feel thirsty? Now I've really seen El Paso. Yes. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. I think Adrian and I share a love of the outdoors and some pretty deep respect for wild spaces and wild places and that these places need to be protected so that our kids can have a healthy place to grow up in. This friendship is something that will last a lifetime. You just never know what you're gonna find trying something new. You just never know what door it'll open. In West Texas, where it's usually dry and dusty, you'll find rolling hills with plenty of prairie grasses. This pristine Chihuahuan desert grassland is the Billingsley Ranch. Aye. Stuart Sasser runs the place. Aye. Aye. He and his wife and father-in-law, Dan Hughes Sr., bought the ranch in 2008. Not long after, a wildfire set them back to square one. And it came up through here and burned about 70% of this ranch. We were able then to start completely over with a new set of fences that are antelope friendly type fences and build a new type of water system. This is one of 50 water troughs on the ranch that we've put up here at a higher elevation in an effort to try to get the cattle to come up into this higher country and graze. When I come up here, it just reminds me how blessed I am to be responsible for this country. And look on a silhouette up there, it looks like. Stewart's approach to uh, management out here is not really all from a cattle production perspective. He really has a holistic view of the place. He wants to improve it for, for the wildlife, the native wildlife. We try to run this country with about a cow to every 50 acres. I think you could probably do it about one to 40, but I try to keep it at about one to 50 acres, and so you don't want to overly graze it. But you know, looking at the place, it's the variety of grasses, it's beautiful. It's, it's in really good shape. You know, a real good example of the Chihuahuan Desert grassland out here. Another grass you'll see that's, that you'll find in swales and wet spots is this stuff right here. It's called uh, vine mesquite. 
And it's one of the few grasses out here that, that really produces a big enough seed that the quail and dub will use it. It makes a good little seed. Stewart's Ranch is also a refuge for the fragile pronghorn, which has been struggling in the Transpecos as of late. With the drought and dwindling numbers, biologists worry that they would disappear from this part of Texas. So to boost numbers, they captured and translocated pronghorn here to West Texas. And his prime grassland habitat was just what biologists needed. We've completed seven translocations since 2011. The Hughes Sasser Ranch served as our release site for pronghorn in 2016. And the result of these translocations is an upturn in the population. And so we've actually doubled our population size since 2012 to today. One prairie management strategy that seems to be helping the pronghorn is a simple change in fencing. There we go. Researchers discovered that these free roaming foragers would rather go under than over. This way pronghorn, when they're ready to pass through the area, are able to just simply move right under the fence. And so this is an all hands on deck effort and it is probably one of the most successful parts of our restoration effort. It's great, that's nice and tight. It's been about seven or eight years project and we've just about opened all the fences in the Marfa area, 300, 400,000 acres worth. The data shows that they use those passes tremendously and I think that's gonna alleviate some of the ups and downs of the population. It's all good pronghorn country. While the road to recovery looks promising for the pronghorn. Makes me feel good. I feel like we're on the right track to get them to come back. Stewart's push to improve this Chihuahuan Prairie continues. Feels like it puts a real responsibility on you to, to work it and maintain it and keep it in a good state and leave it better than the way you found it for the next generation is what you want. Let's go out to the prairie. It's like a nice cool day today to do some work. These students are heading outside to learn a few things about the world around them. Spray your ankles. Today, their classroom is about the size of a tennis court with grass, bugs, and as much biodiversity as they can shake a rake at. This is Wolf Prairie at Westside High School. It was going to be a third student parking lot. And fortunately for everyone, uh, HIC kind of ran out of money to fund the paving of that parking lot. And so it was just left as is. Let's find spots for those milkweeds and put them in the ground. Wolf Prairie is a pocket prairie. Milkweed plant. It's the food that monarchs eat. A small replica of the once wide open coastal prairies of Texas. Our vision for this prairie is that eventually we get back to what it was 250 years ago, which would have been six to nine foot tall grasses mixed with forbs and other wildflowers, plus a few baseballs. <laughs> Having a, a prairie here on campus enables us to bring students out during the school day. We don't have to rent a bus. Anybody remember what these plants are? We can just walk them outside and we have access to wild spaces. Why burning the prairie would have been helpful for its biodiversity? It's going to kill off invasives and then nutrients into the soil. I like to refer to it as the original classroom. The human mind is wired to be attentive to this. This is uh, called tickle tongue or iron wood. You get this weird tickling and numbing sensation on your tongue. This small pocket prairie has made a big impact on students like Akash. Even if I don't get to use this in my career, I definitely plan on being active in the community. Oh, hey you guys, come see, there's a black swallowtail larva here. This is a black swallowtail caterpillar, mm -hmm. and it's just an example of um, oh, yeah. <laughs> how these little prairie patches, even though they're relatively small side. from a landscape scale, can be really great for pollinators. And you feel calmer, you said? Jaime Gonzalez calls himself a relationship counselor. I'm trying to fix a broken relationship between people and nature. I think we're working in a hybrid world. Technology is cool, but that nature, which is very ancient and a part of us, I think needs to be a part of our lives too because it, it keeps us grounded and healthy. That is the message behind author of Last Child in the Woods and co-founder of the Children in Nature Network, Richard Louvre. He explains the nature deficit disorder 
how a lack of exposure to nature can dull the senses and be harmful to one's health. Finally, the people who study child development began to pay attention to the question of how does experiences in nature shape childhood. It's going to be good. Studies ongoing at the University of Illinois, for instance, show that kids with just a little bit of contact with nature, just to walk through trees in an urban park, and the symptoms of attention deficit disorder begin to go down. The kids in the green schools did far better on standardized test scores. If children have less and less experience with nature, who will be the future stewards of the earth? The Katy Prairie near Houston has diminished from 600,000 acres to just 200,000. Now the Katy Prairie Conservancy has partnered with at least a dozen schools that have put in pocket prairies. This is exciting. We're going to be letting these uh, different kinds of grasshoppers go. Across town at the Coulter Elementary School's pocket prairie, these students are getting a lesson about the ecosystem. It's pretty cool because it has the red legs. Yeah, so those are kind of uh, like claws that help it grip onto stuff when it's jumping. Grasshoppers do a lot of things out on the prairie. They provide food for lots of other organisms like birds and mammals and other insects. They recycle nutrients on the prairie back for plant growth. <laughs> but I try to emphasize the good things that insects do and I think bringing them out and letting them touch bugs and showing them that when you hold bugs not all of them are going to bite. They actually do good things. I like to go out in the prairie and garden to grow plants because really nobody really wants to just sit in a class and see the textbooks. They want to interact with and see all of them up close in real life. Yeah, I love it. It's actually kind of cool because Ms. Shang, she's actually the one who does, who did most of it. It's actually it's kind of impressive. It used to look like this. Four years later, now it looks like this. Our idea was to let's just take a small amount and try to put back the plants and grasses and flowers that used to be here before urbanization. These are all going to be tall, like up to here. After decades of teaching, Ali and Sean got busy planting. I'm their, the Coulter Pocket Prairie Guardian. We call him Bison Bob, <laughs> named after my husband. And she's passionate about the prairie. They'll have all these tall yellow flowers. See these, these ones right here, like all of these and these, they're gonna be big, tall ones, lots of yellow on them. And then these grasses, like these are gonna be, these are gonna be tall. And this Indian grass is gonna be tall with these golden waving seed heads. Some of them are like over my head. And so it's gonna be great. And as much as she loves the prairie, it's what prairies do for us that gets her excited. Prairies actually really do a lot of good for the environment. You know, they sequester carbon dioxide, they hold water and the, the, all the prairie wetlands filter the water, so they help clean the water. So prairies really have a lot to offer to people. And people, of course, have a lot to offer to the prairies, especially saving them. Even businesses are realizing the benefits of a prairie. Why do we even have gardens at MD Anderson? And the underlying purpose, no matter what we do, is to create a positive distraction from the burdens of their care and treatment and to reduce stress and stress patients. And that's just what we do with the parks and gardens. Conservation groups have, have got to start putting nature where people are. This is one of the most heavily trafficked places in the whole Houston region, the Texas Medical Center. And so in addition to saving these big grand places like the Katy Prairie, we need to help people in the community find places right where they live and work to have nature. You see them, if you like see them through the glass, we're doing research right now in terms of how big of a grassland do you have to have an impact, but I will tell you this, for that one monarch that was passing by, just having access to a few flowers to fuel up on before it heads on, that's big enough for that monarch. Anytime we can situate a small patch of it anywhere, I think is a victory.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.